Hi, I'm your host Ajay Behel, Corporate Vice President and Head of Mega Verticals in HCL America. And this is a platform where I bring to you perspectives from the industry leaders who are shaping the very future of these industries. Today, we have with us Bask Iyer. Bask is the CEO of Bask Mind, and he also serves as an advisor or board member to several high growth companies, Zoom, Cohesity, Automation Anywhere. Basque brings more than 30 years of experience in executing and driving change. He recently worked as a Chief Information Digital Officer at VMware, managing critical technology systems and driving digital transformation. He has also served as the EVP for Dell Digital, where his team successfully executed the largest technology integration between Dell EMC and the revamp of Dell e-commerce. Prior to this, he's also served as CIO at Juniper Networks, Group CIO and Officer at Honeywell, and executive roles in GlaxoSmithKline and Johnson & Johnson's. Hey, Bask. Uh, welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, Bask, uh, there's a lot that we can leverage your experience from. With. You know, the way I want to start is really talk to you a little about the manufacturing industry. I think we really know there's a throughs of change that are happening in the manufacturing world. Uh, where do you think lies the biggest opportunities for manufacturing companies at this point of time? Yeah, I think... Uh, you know, when I started working uh, 30, 35 years ago, manufacturing, this country was doing a lot in manufacturing. And then you know what happened, we offshored it, outsourced it, whatever. There's a resurgence coming back, big time, with between the pandemic and between the crisis we are having with uh, supply chain, war, et cetera, there's a realization manufacturing is important. But it's not gonna be the same way, there's gonna be a lot of manufacturing automation. And automation, these days, not just includes robotics, but automation, you know, 3D printing, you know, in blockchain technology and so on. So there's a big resurgence going on in manufacturing. The, the problem you're going to have is do you have people with domain knowledge to do it? Because very few of our kids have actually gone through a manufacturing floor or seen a shop. So there's a little bit of a gap there from an from a, a experience standpoint, but the technology is amazing. This is nowhere close to what I was working when I started in manufacturing, right? The, the degree of advancement that's made in robotics and artificial intelligence is un unfathomable. So the big trend is going to be automation. The big trend is going to be uh, in shop floor automation and, uh, uh, and the data collection. And things like IoT and Edge, which we can talk about more, I'm truly excited by it, what's happening there. And where do you see the maturity of these applications? I know these, these are exactly the things that are defining, I think, you said it right. I mean, we have job, manufacturing coming back. Yeah. But we don't know whether the jobs are coming back and what skill set is required to really make it happen. But really, I think if you can expand on that a little bit more, I think. Yeah, jobs are coming back. I think when people think, you know, is, is the same job that we did 40 years coming back, I don't think so. Yeah. But there's great opportunities for people in, to automate the floors. So, you know, you, you can do lights out factories. We were doing that. 40 years ago, you know, right. my title was computer integrated manufacturing person. SIM was a big deal. And we could shut the lights off in the factory and it still work all night long. So it's not like we don't know how to do it. It is just that, you know, we have to apply it now and the technology is uh, mind boggling. So I think it's opportunity. The, the, the problems are going to be, it's going to be talent. It's not going to be technology. And you need to find a rich blend of talent from different age groups, is multi-generational. You need the youngsters and people who are early experienced who are familiar with Kubernetes and AI and ML and so on. But you also need people who understand how manufacturing works, where to optimize, you know, domain knowledge and so on. So I think a blend of those needs to happen and that's going to be our challenge. Oh, absolutely, totally understand. And when you actually go into the technologies themselves, uh, what is that one technology that is going to be most relevant across the spectrum? I think, it, to me, if people always look at that one. I think it's a combination of all that has happened. You know, so I look back and say, cloud technology. I mean, that is going to be huge. But then advancements in edge technology, that's huge. 5G, IoT. And then you know, yesterday I was working with startup community and I was they were doing a load testing for manufacturing real-time simulation. And I looked at just the testing methodology that they used, that they could load, they could simulate the thousands of uh, bottles being made and, you know, a sensor reading it. That test would have taken me months to develop. Right. And they're, you know, these people are just doing it in like 10 days and 10, you know, 
10 hours. They're writing this code to do load testing. So all technology important. I think cloud is, uh, is going to be pretty big. Kubernetes is going to be pretty big. The advanced uh, uh, artificial intelligence and all those are good. It's the combination of all that in manufacturing. That's become critical. But if I have to pick one or two, I think the development we do on edge is just uh, outstanding. Right. Uh, it's just outstanding that amount of processing that could be done in the shop floor on edge technology. And then it's kind of a seamlessly connected to your data center or to the cloud, the multi-cloud between the big cloud providers, public cloud providers, to your data center, to the edge. We didn't have architecture to do all this, you know, even a few years ago. So I, I think that would be huge. Uh, people talk about blockchain. I still feel like blockchain is a solution that is waiting for a problem in manufacturing. <laughs> uh, you know, if the technology absolutely works, everybody's thrilled about Bitcoin's it. Bitcoin's a park. Yeah, Bitcoin's a park. So, so it needs some people to have domain knowledge to know how can you apply blockchain towards manufacturing. I, I could see a use case in supply chain, for example. But um, 5G, you know, I mean, we are getting close to ubiquitous networking now. So things like inventory tracking and so on become so much easier with 5G. And, and you know, 5G is happening. We've been talking about 5G for a long time. Right. But it's happening now. Right, right. And, but, you know, so all these technologies are available. Uh, they are finding their way into manufacturing, but I think they're still one step at a time. So I think one of the biggest things that you talk about, right, is how do you change the engine of a plane that is flying? If yeah. we don't have to do it once, we'll know exactly what we need to do. But yeah. you know, there's, I think the most uh, CIOs, uh, people in your shoes, right, uh, they would find a lot of things challenging, right? And so in your mind, what are the biggest challenges that a CIO, a CDO, uh, CXO would really be facing in trying to make sure that this dream to, you know, yeah. lights out manufacturing really, which was possibly 40 years back also, becomes a reality in the future. And is that the desired output as well? Or really, where is that sweet spot? Yeah, I think I think the, the issue is going to be, honestly, uh, you need to find good uh, CIOs and digital people who are willing to learn and change. So if, if you don't, if you feel like you arrived since you spent 30 years in the business or whatever, you're still doing the same ERP and the same systems and the business is not respecting you. Yes. Because if it takes five years to implement an ERP or four years to implement ERP, you're following a yesterday's dream. Yes. And you're excluded from shop floor. Like, you know, there's a whole classification of uh, digital people and OT people. So sadly, a lot of my colleagues are not even aware of what is happening on the shop floor, which is a lot of the money being spent. So the first thing I tell folks is, you know, you have to show interest. Yes. And so the business includes you, right? And if you all, if you have, typically, you know, when a CI, you have a long list of projects and most of them are ERP, email, network, all that is important. But if you do all that, the business guys are going to hire other people to, do to go do those things. They won't even call it an IT project. Yes. The sad part is a lot of CIOs don't even realize that all the stuff we are talking about is an IT project. Yes. They look at it as somebody in engineering, somebody in shop floor, they call it, you know, OT or whatever. And that is the exciting, that, that's where the CEOs and other people want to look and see is, you know, how can you automate that? So first thing I tell them is develop an interest towards this. You know, uh, it's okay to say you don't know and get mentors to learn. Uh, and sometimes most of us feel like we've done supply chain for 20 years, we know what we're talking about. I think that is the problem. So I think initially mindset has to change. And then creating this culture, right? Why would anybody, why would good talent come and work for you? I mean, if, if you want to get somebody who knows IoT, Edge, blockchain, multi-cloud, Kubernetes, how can a manufacturing company, how can you, uh, you know, how can you afford them? Or, or how can you even attract them? So unless the CIO, the IT departments are a little bit more inspiring yes. and they're open-minded and they're more nurturing. So it starts with culture and then strategy and then people and then process and technology comes last. Right. But we typically jump and say, hey, can we put blockchain in manufacturing? Yeah. You can, but does anybody in your department knows blockchain? Does, do you know do you know the domain strengths there? You know, do you know how to support it? So I tell people you have to follow that. You can't you can't jump into, you know, let's go find a cool uh, um, technology somewhere and put it in. You have to go through, you know, interest, you know, culture change attracting the talent. Okay. Now, if you attract talent, just think about this practically. Say you go hire your children or my children to come and work in the shop floor, 
and you have old PLC controllers and you have, <laughs> you know, the kind of things we're used to. Yeah. First of all, they won't understand and they wouldn't work. No chance. No chance, right? So you have to modernize and, and you have to go into a modern application development. You have to go into an agile methodology. Uh, you have to make it cool. And you have to also use the newer tools like Kubernetes and so on. Otherwise, you know, most factories, people would look for ladder logic changing or, or you know, those kind of programming. Do you people actually understand that? I mean, is that, a, you know, are people spending money based on the fact that, you know, there is obsolescence that is likely to happen from a people perspective? And if the people are retiring, you really definitely need a younger workforce. Or is that? I don't think it's thing? happening. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I mean, that's what we need to wake up and say, you know, um, Yes, the, the big uh, tech companies, Google and Amazon, and they, they are sucking the talent out. But you have to change your culture. You have to be, make it attractive. I mean, you know, if you're a young person, would you like to drive a, you know, one of the, um, a modern car or you know, for a daily driver, or do you want to drive an antique? Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, once in a while, it's cute to drive it, but you don't want to be driving that to work every no, day. Sense, no. So, and there's in manufacturing, especially because there's a, big uh, demand on sweating assets and cost savings and so on. We try to have so many old gear that we're trying to work. Good luck trying to get good talent to come and work there. Yeah. So you need, I, I would do a cheating. I would do a combination of you don't throw all the old things out, but you have to create at least a few innovation projects that you get the talent in, right? Like I would work, if you give me a 20% opportunity to work on innovation projects, I don't mind doing 80% maintenance. But if you tell me 130 percent, I'm going to work on some back office maintenance projects. I'm not going to. So clearly, you are a big proponent of agile, putting it together, give everybody the opportunity to try and do the entire spectrum versus try to do a run versus build organization. No, that doesn't work. They call it, uh, you know, two-faced uh, IT. There's a term for it. Yes. But you know, who wants to be on on the low? Say, say, you know, <laughs> I have an IT department, and you know, you belong there. You can choose. Do you want to be on the high speed, cool, or the old, ugly part? Yeah, where are you going to put your hands up? <laughs> So I don't think it works. It creates a, like a caste system between IT departments and the, the functionality doesn't work. So you need to have everybody work on innovation. I mean, you can have some mentors to guide people, but you know, you and I want to learn. Somebody everybody wants to learn. a little bit on that multimodal, right? Yeah. Like current bimodal or whatever. Yeah. You know, but there is this concept of system of record yeah. and system of uh, innovation. You don't want your system of record to be working the changes in the same fashion, et cetera, because you don't, you want to have the stability in the system of record versus right. system of innovation. So how do you, uh, you know, kind of bring that dichotomy back into what you just said? Yeah. Because everybody wants to work on this, but there's an importance to the system of record. Yeah. Right? I, I change that much. Yeah. I agree with the system of records and system of engagement. But not, you don't divide people among, would you like to work on systems of records or six systems of engagement? And people, you know, they will all want to be on the cooler stuff, right? So I, I think, uh, I think it's good to look at IT into those categories. This could be radical. I would not spend any more money upgrading system of thing, system of records anymore. It yeah. is old and ugly. I've implemented a lot <laughs> of them and I try to use them, you know, yeah. I, 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 <clears throat> but I try to certify myself as a supplier on, some of the systems I've implemented now as a customer, it is terrible. I feel sorry for implementing those systems. It's so old, so ugly, unable, I'm unable to use them. And we spend millions and millions and millions of dollars on these old ERP systems. Most of the enterprise class systems are 20, 25 years old, right? I mean, this, the companies are 50 years old. True. Uh, so if and they've been kind of not innovating, they've been adding incrementally to that software. So, you can't spend 40 million to do another ERP now. So I tell people every project I go in manufacturing, they say, let's fix ERP, let's go to one big, uh, and I, you're just sucking away a lot of innovation ideas out. So you have to put a wall around it, cement it, make sure it's running yeah. and abstract it and go to the modern technology. Now, all of us, again, I said, if you give me 20% to do cool things, I will do the 80%. <laughs> I wouldn't say, you know, uh, but you, you, you can just put me on, on, on something that is obsolete. So it's a little controversial. I deliberately try to be controversial to say, don't keep pouring more and more and more money into this, you know, find other ways. But having said that, though, I mean, I go, let me just give you a story. Well, 35 years ago, I was in Johnson & Johnson, and we implemented a thing called AMAPS. That was the MRP system. And we spent millions of dollars, you know, and I was a younger guy there. And uh, my plant manager asked me for, can you give me a back order report, mm -hmm. right? To get it in AMAPS for me, I had to go beg the MIS department and I have to ask somebody, they get in line, this project's mile long. 
So what we were able to do is figure out a way to download a report, screen scrape it, put it in a, I think at that time you had Borland Paradox on database, put it in a database, put it in a PC, put it in a laptop in front of the plant manager. The business guys were just, they couldn't believe that in two days we can do something like that. And they would look at the report, put it proudly on a big monitor they and watch happy. it. They were happy. Very That's happy. exactly what they wanted. The data is in the system of yes. records. Yes. But they were all talking about this is what they wanted, yeah. right? So if we did do that, I think somewhere along the line we've forgotten and started going towards just doing everything with the systems of engagement and, you know, just do it in one monolithic way. I, I honestly believe that it's dead. You know, you need to have some systems in back, but you need to have front-end engagement systems. And, uh, and, and you need to be shopping around. You know, trying to get all from one vendor is what I had done before, you know, but I think that's the wrong yeah. way to go. That's, that's gone. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we talk about manufacturing companies and I look at your experience, it's actually fairly varied, right? Uh -huh. You worked in other industries as well. Um, when you look at manufacturing today, where is it that manufacturing can learn most from other industries? I think uh, um, I, it's traditional manufacturing, I mean, I always feel the sweet spot is marrying the Silicon Valley to traditional companies. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the manufacturing companies, having worked on both sides, sometimes I come to Silicon Valley and I feel like, oh, these guys are just flying by the seat of the pants. They have no idea of scaling. <laughs> you know, everybody's an SVP, VP, and I'm thinking, you haven't really yeah. built a company. You don't know what it is to run. But then I go into the traditional companies, and it's like three years to do a project. Yes. In, in about three years, you form a company like Zoom. You create a product, you hire people, you know, you create a PL, you you go IPO and you make a record profit, right? Exactly. It's that that's a that takes a project in traditional companies just to do yeah. that. So clearly you need to marry the West Coast agility, speed, creativity, innovation with some of the rigor that you have on on the traditional companies that uh, that have built scale. So I think people who can do that combination are going to be very useful. Very, very few people can so do you, it. You see manufacturing companies hire, hiring CIOs or CDOs from Silicon Valley companies? There's a lot of demand. They're not hiring. They're not able to hire. Yeah. How would you attract? This is the question. <laughs> so how would you attract? And, and so we have to think a little bit about what would it make it attractive for those folks to come. Now, if you have a good cause, say healthcare companies are cool again. I worked for a healthcare company for 10 years and, and the healthcare was slow and boring to work. And as a young person, I was very irritated working in healthcare I because understand. of regulation and so on, right? I totally understand. So, you know, blow your brains off trying to roll out a system sometimes. Yes. But with the with COVID, we are yes. all having a realization that that is really critical, important. And the vaccines that took 10, 15 years to launch have been launched in a year, yes. three or four, a lot with information technology, right? And hard work as well. So certain companies which, which have those kind of mission can attract the best talent. Yeah. If you don't have a mission, you don't have a culture, and you know, you're still stuck in the in the traditional way and say, can you come and maintain the systems I have and make it better? It's not gonna work. It's not gonna work. I mean, people will be polite, nobody's gonna be rude and tell you anything. They'll just say, No, I'm fine, I'm happy where I am. So, yeah, and if you know, look at Gen Z, I don't think those are the people who are actually likely to come to office any which way because the only way they need to now know how to work is really uh, work from home. And they work hard. I mean, I've watched my kids. I'm sure you watched your kids. I'm thinking, wow, they're goofing off is my first reaction. <laughs> I look and say, my God, they're working very hard. They're very yes. committed and they don't want me to go into the room to disturb them. So I think it's a little old fashioned for us to assume the only people. And I've seen people in the campuses Sometimes I can never be productive in the campus because everybody's coming to talk to you about the football game or I know, that right? kind of stuff. <laughs> so I need to go home to be, get the work done. So I, I'm, I, I'm not saying one way or the other. I just feel like, you know, we need to find some hybrid work. We have to be flexible. You have to go where the talent is. And there's a huge talent shortage right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of people available, but not good talent available. So, you know, you need to be really clever on attracting the best talent uh, right now. So, and the culture, so culture is very important. Manufacturing, 100%. You have to make manufacturing cool, you know. And how do you how do you make it cool? It's a tough industry, you know. It's a tough margins, but you have to figure out a way to make it cool and interesting for people to come and work.